Cracker Brew. What's up, everybody? This is B Rad, your host of Crack a Brew and Smoke a Few. I got my third guest on today, which is my dad. Crack a Brew, Smoke a Few, you know what I'm saying? Hey. I got a little screwdriver rocking right now. I don't know how this setup's gonna be because I'm not in the vocal booth. So I don't know if the sound's gonna be echoey or not. This is just, I guess, an experiment. I'm hoping it goes well because you're trying to, you know, tell them the story about your book. I'm going to give you a little rundown. You remember, I mean, when I wrote this book, uh, the book's called The Foe. It's been out for just over 10 years. I started it in 2000, and um, I wanted to write it because I wanted to tell the story that I grew up knowing uh, as a little kid growing up in the city of Fontana. So uh, my son, you remember when you were in uh, junior high and high school? So when I was writing this book, Braddy was still in school, and I would pay him and my nephew Kyle money, uh, you know, just to listen to some of the chapters and they would lay in bed and just wish I would shut up and I would read them just so they could get 20 bucks or 15 bucks. Remember those days? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, but the story is a social conflict story that I, uh, uh, wanted to share that, you know, that went on for almost 50 years. And, and I'd heard the years through, uh, the story through the years of, uh, you know, growing up as a little kid. And I got to live it when I watched my cousin, who passed away in 1996, uh, was killed by a drunk driver on 4th of July. And uh, he was the first quarterback in 1974 to beat Redlands. So it was a social conflict story between the boss's employees at Kaiser Steel and Kaiser Hospital. And it's kind of like a Friday Night Lights, Varsity Blues and stuff. But it had, uh, where we grew up, uh, football was intense, you know. So uh, after they bombed Pearl Harbor, in 1942, eight months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, they wanted to, uh, uh, you know, they wanted to build a steel mill on the West Coast because it was taking so long to get steel from Pittsburgh to San Francisco Bay to build uh, Liberty supply ships for war to, you know, send food and ammunition to the uh, soldiers to help fight the war. So it was taking two weeks to by train just to get enough steel to San Francisco to make one to make uh, one ship. So eight months after they bombed Pearl Harbor, uh, Roosevelt picked uh, Kaiser and they picked Fontana because it was uh, 50 miles from LA and 65 miles from the ocean. They built this uh, Air Force base around it to protect it during the wartime because they were uh, they didn't want it to be too close to the coast. And it was also because of the limestone that was in the ground, they were gonna choose either Colton or uh, Fontana. So at the time, uh, all the people that lived in that area were kind of farmers, and they had to go to school in Riverside and in um, San Bernardino or Chafee. So 10 years after they started building the steel mill, uh, Kaiser uh, was the, uh, he was known for making bridges all over the world and famous for that. Uh, a funny story, though, that not many people do know about, I think you're with me, when the gentleman told us one time, we were in Northern California, when the guy who told us the story about uh, when uh, to pay Kaiser, uh, there's a day in history somewhere in 1942 that the government had put all the uh, Japanese people in concentration camps since their uh, country had bombed us. So they didn't, you know, they didn't know. So they put them all these in these camps, and and any property that they owned as a down payment to the Kaiser family, they sign that property over to the Kaisers. Mm. I mean, that's crazy, right? I mean, yeah. so, so anyway, the story was a social comp. So from 42 to 52, uh, 12 million people came from Nebraska, New York, Florida, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, like our family came from. And they uh, helped the area grow. San Bernardino and Riverside County blew uh, from 42 to 52. 12 million people had came to our area. Now, once a farm and uh, fruit area, and Fontana was actually a pig farm at that time, uh, they founded, you know, they uh, decided 
to now it became industrial a little bit. You know, that industrial revolution. They started helping support the war and, and they found this place to live. So after about 1952, they started building high schools in the area of in Fontana, Colton, Rialto. And that's where all the workers, the blue collar men lived. And, and they were all tough men. I mean, there was some Hells Angels, KKK, uh, Black Panthers, uh, uh, Mexican and Italian mafia. I mean, the men that lived in this area were all tough men and they all worked together and got along together. But what happened was the bosses were all the white collar people. And so when they opened the school in the 52s, they, uh, they used to have these uh, picnics, okay? And what happened was every year when the uh, employees would bring their family, uh, after they opened the school, the uh, boss's kids would beat the employees' kids in sports. And the men were really tough from this area, and it didn't sit well with the parents, and they would look down on them. So for 20 years in a row in football, the boss's kids at the Kaiser Hospital and Kaiser Still would kick the shit out of the... <laughs> Fonta am I allowed to cuss on this? Yeah. Okay, okay, good, good, okay. Just check it. Okay, I wasn't sure if we're PG thirteen. I wouldn't know. I don't know. Huh? So I'm sipping me a screwdriver here. Okay, so the story goes, they um twenty years in a row they kicked the boss the boss's kids, they kicked the employees' kids' ass. And they felt that these men were some of the toughest men in in the area, but they couldn't beat them in football. So the town and the city got sick of it. They couldn't they couldn't stand it. So they had these 11 liquor stores that were wrapped around the steel mill, which is off of Cherry and San Bernardino Avenue. And what happened was, uh, it's now California Speedway where they do all the racing now, but the liquor stores where they cash your check on uh, Thursdays. So every Thursday, the men would go by the hundreds there and they would cash their checks there. And, and that's where all the uh, people were voted into city councilmen, mayor. A lot of politics went on there and a lot of you know, uh, shenanigans, I think, too, because you'd see people drinking, smoking weed, uh, prostitutions. Just I, like we do on this show. Yeah, hey, hey. So, right, right, that would like So, what I, as a little kid, remember in the early 70s is I would ride my bike down and go with my cousin Ronnie and Johnny, and we would go down to one of the local uh, liquor stores and we would pick up bottles because you would get a nickel a bottle. Mm -hmm. So, we wanted to just, you know, cash checks, get some money do whatever we had to do to hustle to get some extra change to go to a, a matinee or a movie. So the uh, bosses, uh, I mean, the um, the in those days, they didn't have private security. Mm. So you know what they did? Mm. They would have Hell's Angels because Hell's Angels actually originated in um, Fontana. Did you know that? Mm -mm. It was a club in here, a bike club in Fontana. But the first chapter was actually in San Bernardino. Okay, mm -hmm. the very first chapter of Hell's. So they were kind of hired as private security. So that, Brady, there would be million dollar payrolls um, in these liquor stores. Million dollars every Thursday. So they would have these tough, roughneck bikers that were just tough as hell. And they would sit there on like little barstools. I'm a little kid, and there would be guns. And they that's how they would sit there, like to protect the back end. And these liquors, oh, local liquor store guys would pay them whatever they paid them. I mean, you know, to be their private security every week in case things got out of hand and it never really got out of hand so me as a little kid that's what I remember going in to get candy or chips or soda pop I remember seeing these long haired tough looking dudes like what the hell is it you know but I didn't know I didn't know anything you know I was a little kid so anyway 20 questions so that's a little backstory. so after 20 years of beating uh, uh, the boss's kids in sports, and they look down on the kids every year at the company picking it as you're nothing's going to come about of you. You're going to always, you're going to be just like your dad. You're going to be working here at the steel mill. And I, so I, as I got older, they started telling me these stories. I said, You're hot. So when we got to school, they would tell us um, when we were in Little League and, and junior high and stuff, every time we'd play a rental in school, they said, You better beat these kids. If you don't beat these kids, you're going to be working for them for the rest of your life. And they're going to hold that over you. Well, we didn't know what the hell they were talking about, you know, but as kids. And then they would tell us when we got into high school, if you don't win this game, you're not going to get Christmas. And we were like, what the hell? Why are we going to get no Christmas? Mm -hmm. You know, so this is what the coaches and some of the crazy parents would be telling us when we'd be in houses. So you know what they meant? Mm -hmm. So every year, uh, the employees would get a Christmas bonus check. And sometimes they'd bet $100 or $50 or 
sometimes they bet their whole check or even a thousand dollars on the game and rumor has it in 1982 between colton and fontana was a couple hundred thousand dollars bet on the game and so the fontana guys had lost and they had to pay up but who knows if it's true but rumor has it Dang. and the people that work there is that crazy yeah so that's how intense our games were and if you wore your letterman jacket back in those days to another town you could possibly get beat up. I mean, it was so crazy because, you know, there was only one town, but one high school back then, so it was a lot of more school pride. So we always hated Reynolds Fontana. So that was kind of a little backstory. You want to see it? Yeah, show them the book. How do they get to see it? Right there, filming. Are we filming me? Yeah. We're talking? Yeah. I didn't know we were on camera. I, don't I know. was. That's why I was looking over here and then back at you. Like, I was kind of like... Wow, so I didn't know. I didn't want to seem awkward just looking at you and not Wait, the You should have told me how to put the camera there. Sorry, yeah. guys. Okay, we didn't know. So the book's the foe. I actually shot this at Montana High School when they did it, and the school opened it up on a Friday night, and they turned the lights, and three different photos were taken to to make that cover. And and this, you know, so the story it says from the ashes of Pearl Harbor, rose a steel mill on the west coast that would help build uh, battleships and supply ships for war. The bosses and employees would create another war that was settled on a high school football field for 25 years so it would create a dynasty for the next 25 years so that was the log line but it said um, the coaches didn't just prepare us for football they prepared us for life they strengthened our minds and body as well as our body and left a never ending impression with the life lessons we learned on the football field it helped us prepare for the journey ahead and instilled in us the confidence to overcome any obstacle so this story I, I've been offered so it took me about eight years to actually finish writing the uh, the book, and then I self published it. I was going to try to publish it through Kraus Publishing, but they only offered like fourteen thousand dollars, and they wanted all the rights, and they send you like a book of like a contract with like forty pages on it. So when you read it all through it, it says we own all the rights, and I wanted to write a movie to it. So when the economy crashed in 2008 and 2007 you remember mm -hmm. and I'd lost all my houses and uh, my car and uh, everything you know $110,000 and I had to go live on my brother's couch for like six months and uh, what happened was I I decided well I'm going to finish writing that script and I didn't really know how to write a script I didn't even know how to write a book and uh, but I knew that I was a smart guy I went to a smart college and I figured you know I'll figure this out myself so I wrote the book, The Foe, and then I uh, wrote the movie. And then I had Francis Ford Coppola's partner, FR Productions, Fred Roos. Uh, they had my script for nine months. They did The Outsiders. They did Godfather 1 and 2. Uh, their lawyers had contacted me, and, you know, I thought they were going to buy it. You know, and I kind of was, you know, I kind of blew that. I shouldn't negotiate my own deals. You know, you know how I am. Well, I talk a little too much sometimes. So... The crazy thing is, uh, the I go and pitch it to these things called pitch fests. Are you familiar with the pitch fest? Yes. Do you know what it is, though? Yeah, you go to them like every year. I know, but what what goes on? I know, but what are you, they? You pitch your story. Correct. Your idea. Like, so any movie, any Netflix, any series, any show you might have, you go to these Hollywood pitch fests, and uh, they'll be anywhere from 30 to... 50 movie studios or production companies. But it, to me, after I've been doing it for four or five years, and uh, it's not a, a slant on the, on the movie industry, but it's like flipping houses, okay? So what they do is, uh, I wish I would have I known we were on camera. I would have been looking in the damn camera. It's all good. Okay, is that good? I was just telling the story. Okay. Just whatever. I'd have kept my stomach in. and. Uh, I think it was natural because then you came in and we were having a conversation, so the camera's just capturing it. So. Yeah. There you go. So I got sidetracked like I always do. But um, what happened was um, they had the, uh, at the pitch fishes, you get five minutes. So I have this video sizzle reel that you actually made mm -hmm. for me. Brad, he helped me make it. He's very talented with videos. And he actually helped me make this. He did a great job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, 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 it was so real that the newspapers had contacted us. And we launched three different ones, right? Remember? We did three of them because... We entered one in what was it Ben Affleck and uh, Matt Damon's what was it, the Green Light Project Green Light yeah. or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we did one for them. So it's stated in that thing if you 
if you make it, they own the rights. So I did it for a contest for Project Green Rights. So we made one kind of a for them. Then we made another one for the LA Pitch Fest. And then we made one uh, for myself that we put on YouTube. And we released them all at the same day. Mm -hmm. And so when it came out, people thought it was an actual movie. And it's a really, really good. You'll have to dub it into this what's, podcast. What's your YouTube channel? I think it's the foe, right? Dennis Paulson, the foe, yeah, right? Yeah, so if you go on YouTube, you can check out the trailer. Yeah, it's called it's called uh, Dennis Paulson, the foe movie trailer. And I've also got the foe chronicles. And the foe chronicles, I have a five-minute one, and I got an hour one. So my goal is in the next couple years... In, at least in the next six months is I'm going to finish my audio book and you're going to help me with that hopefully right he's got a really cool studio here I don't know if you know that or if you've ever seen it but mm -hmm. he had to put that on camera and um, built that and actually that four that we got came from a uh, actual studio in LA uh, where and the people from Motown were interviewed in on that stage and so that was actually the floor to uh, you know to a studio in LA and I happen to know the gentleman that, that did that freelance and, and independent stuff. So what Bobby gave to me, he uh, said, I put that in our garage for about a year and a half. And I come to find out, you know, uh, that some of the people from Motown were actually interviewed on that floor. And then we created that. You and Kyle made it into a studio. It's that's really crazy. cool. So that's pretty crazy. Not to get sidetracked. But that's what I do. I get good. So uh, the movie industry is crazy. They offer you, like, Ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars. I mean, I was offered a hundred thousand by a company. Uh, they patronized me, and they said they were going to pay. It was uh, Sports Studios. They patted me on the back and says, "You know what? It's gonna, we're going to have to pay a writer a hundred thousand dollars." And they wanted all the rights. They wanted me to walk away. And I and my whole thing is, I want this to be made into a movie. You know, so that's the purpose. I read the script, and the script's like three and a half hours long. So they're going to have to condense it, take some dialogue out. You know, add some series of shots, sequence of shots, or montages. And, and you know, professional writers know how to do that. I mean, I've got the story there that I want, and we can chop it and, you know, condense it however we want. But but I want that story to be read in full, and then if we decide to take stuff out or shorten it, parts of it, we can do that. You know what mm -hmm. I mean, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that was the whole thinking on that. So I went and pitched it, and I, I've got some big companies. But it takes five to thirty million dollars to write, a, a, to do a sports movie, you know, and it's a period piece, so that's a little different too. So, uh, kind of a action drama sports thing, right? Mm -hmm. Real life story. So these production companies are like uh, realtors. They're like they they want to flip your script. They want all the rights for as cheap as they can, and they're cleaning up a little bit. Then they're gonna flip it to a bigger production company change the name and they want you to walk away <laughs> that's, that's why being I think independent is probably better like if you if you were a filmmaker and a script and yeah. a book writer mm -hmm. it would be awesome but right, right. like Kevin Smith he he, uh, he does that he, he's a script writer and he shot his own movie got his friends together mm -hmm. shot a movie mm -hmm. only if you knew some people that were into that like filming but these games were amazing to watch and to see. We had our own airplane. And on the cover here, I don't know if you can see the cover, but Brad, you'll have to bring that close up. But what made us famous in uh, November 6th of 1982, uh, the week before that, at the end of October, just for, uh, I almost want to say it was like Halloween night or the night before Halloween night, we played a game in Burbank, mm -hmm. in Burles of Bamberg. And your dad actually uh, was kicked out of the game. Yeah. yeah, I punched a guy, kicked a guy, and a face mask a guy. So, um, when I was ejected on my third time, each time you got a penalty at Fontana, uh, it started somewhere in the 70s from the old lineman. You'd have to take off your helmet, put your hands behind your head like this, and from elbow to elbow, you want to test that out, Ronnie? Mm -hmm. So you'd have to slap me from elbow to elbow, just like that, okay? Mm -hmm. And it got a little intense, you know what I mean? So... Uh, when you were doing sprints in uh, high school, it was actually kind of funny. So, uh, you know, your first time going out for uh, football, you got to quit saying, uh, mm -hmm. but your first time going out for football, you uh, had to run sprints at the end of practice. And if you weren't real savvy on offense and you didn't know what we're going on two or we're going on three meant, right? The coaches were purposely said, we're going on three. 
So they go down, set, hut. And so, hut, hut. So, but on the first hut, all the young kids that were ninth grade, that you know, they just wanted to take off running. And then you would hear the seniors and the big old hairy, big dudes buffed out. Because the guys at our school were, they were men. You know, they benched three, four, five hundred pounds. And 220 to 250 pounds, they were big. So as a young freshman, you'd be in 120 pounds, 140 pounds. You remember, you played football. So they, uh, they would try to intimidate you. So they would say, slap that motherfucker, hit him, get his ass. Because the sprint that you'd have to run 10 perfect sprints, that sprint wouldn't count because you jumped off sides. So you'd have the biggest, scariest motherfucker walking up to you and you'd have your hands behind your head and they would slap the shit right out of you. And so eventually after like six years in that game in Burbank, playing Burles of Burbank, I was ejected out of the game. I actually lost the game for us too. Not only was I ejected, because when I was kicked out of the game, Bradley, they had to put another person in my place named Billy Simra for uh, the kickoff, and he didn't know where to line up, and he lined up in the wrong spot, and they ran the kickoff all the way back, and they beat us 13 to 10. Mm. Yeah, terrible. So, but anyway, not only did I kick down on the game, I lost the game for us. So, but what happened was we were in Burbank, and that was like the media mecca of the world at that time. And so uh, I got slapped three different times. I got hit each time for face mask and kick down. And I got hit so hard the third time that the guy cuffed his knuckles and he buckles me, Brad, across the face. And back then they had those like MMA gloves and they were leather. So when they got wet, they were like hard, buddy, and they would cut your face. And he busts my lip open. I'm spitting blood. And not only am I on the sidelines, the coach is telling me, your ass ain't going to play. You're never going to play another down of football ever again. I was like, oh, shit. It's crazy. So it's crazy, right? Is that crazy? Mm-hmm. So that's the shit they would tell us, right? So we even had our own airplane. So we had a digitized airplane that would fly over the games. And our school town was so crazy, Brad, we would get ten to 20,000 people at a game. In one game, in uh, a championship game in 1989, there was 29,000 people at a high school football game. They had to play the game in Angel Stadium. See that picture right there? All the way up. Wow. Yeah, crazy stuff. Uh, you can't see it now. Brad would have to give a close-up on that. But it's three decks of people, and they had to play the game in Angel Stadium. There was over 29,000 people. And it was against two teams in the same league. And our, our league was so tough that uh, six teams had played within an 11-year period in a state championship. And three different teams had won five state championships in 10 years out of the same league. Riverside Poly won two, Fontana won two, and Eisenhower won one. And so, anyway, very competitive, very tough league at that time. So, I get slapped. The LA Times comes out, does a story on us. Wide World of Sports, 60 Minutes, and Dan Rather. They come out. So now, all of a sudden, the whole nation knows about it. The New York Times is doing stories on us in November 6th in 1982. And they're going crazy. And now I'm not allowed to to be interviewed because I was the guy that was ejected in the game. So the next week, not only am I not allowed to play varsity, they make me dress out and play in a JV game just to embarrass me because, you know, whatever. So I was so upset. So it comes out, the story comes out, you know, we're like crazy. All the Dave Cameron, all the big studs, Robbie Ellis. But Robbie Ellis busted my lip and he was one of the big linebackers. What year was this? 82. Wow. Yeah, I'm old, right? We got some days on that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm old, right? Yeah. I still play sports. Let me know. 80s sound crazy. Mm hmm. And I still, and I coached high school and college football, as you know, for 22 years. And so, because I had the knowledge, uh, I was a sports announcer. And because I had that knowledge as a coach and as a player, and, uh, as a, you know, a backup player, a starter, I played college, uh, a coach, I was a sports announcer. I saw it for all these different angles. So I wanted to tell the story like a Benjamin Button kind of a story where I covered 26 years, made the coaches the main characters. And I, so I start the story in 99, 2000, and I bring it back to the early 70s, and I end it in 89. So I tell the story as the protagonist at five different ages. So at five different ages, I'm uh, telling the story as a little kid watching my cousin. Because in those days, you know, uh, all the little kids looked up to the 
the older kids in the town. You know, we wanted to be like them. You know, we don't have as much social media and stuff like that. So it was really kind of a small niche thing. You know, whoever the, the studs were at the uh, Little League Park or at the Pop Warner Parks, those were the guys you looked up to. Hey, man, I want to be like Steve Kadena. I want to be like Vince Franco. I want to be like the Phippses, you know, whoever it was, uh, the Silverthorns, you know, whatever. Because you would hear those guys. They were like legends in the schoolyards, you know. Mm -hmm. So my cousin was who I wanted to be like. And so when I went to my first game, I tell that story in the book and I, with my brother Jimmy and how we got there and, you know, what we saw and what it changed the way. You know, we used to like music. We were into like kiss and dressing up wearing wigs and the the stilt shoes and you know playing like our fake air guitars in the in the closets and doing all that crazy stuff right mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh we'd even do um to make extra bunny as little kids me jose alex Pius, and my brother jimmy we would go door to door and have his mom drop us off and we would sing christmas carols yeah Oh, yeah, buddy. Silent night, holy night. Anyway, so, Rudolph. I, I guess we could put that in uh, next year's Christmas episode. Hey. <laughs> so, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Reindeer, had a very shiny nose, shiny nose. So, anyway, so we would do those things to make money. We didn't care. We were hustlers, okay? Mm -hmm. But the way our game, but our whole lifestyle changed. After we went to our first game, we jumped the fence, watched my cousin, and they were announcing them on the speaker, and we saw all these people, you know, some people drinking out of flask, and so I just, they were like, the whole town was there to watch them play. And all of a sudden, we wanted to be like them, and we started playing football. And we started watching football. And we became involved at probably the age of 10. And in the schoolyards and streets and front yards, we would play mud football, do whatever we want. It was such a magical moment for us as a little kid that, you know, it changed our life the way we thought. Everyone wanted to be like someone older. Is that crazy? Yeah. And so... That's why I wanted those moments to be shared. And then what happened in the book at the end, why I chose 2000, because I was coaching in 99-2000 when the head coach, Dick Bruick, came in, and, and he was part of uh, John Tyree. They started the streak in 74 with my cousin. They didn't beat the boss's kids. They lost 22-21 to Rebens and never beat him. But the following year, Lester Wallen, he died of cancer. And so I dedicated the book to my cousin, Pat Embry, and Lester Wallen, and they were two of the, the first quarterbacks that took Fontana to the playoffs. And Lester, who helped um, beat Fontana, I mean, beat Rubens for the first time. The whole town shut down, Brad. You couldn't have seen it. The steel mill was honking. They they would have parades. So then in 1979, I share a few stories in here. Uh, what the um, When they finally beat Rubens and became the first outright Citrus Belt League champions, the police gave the coaches an escort up Sierra. Imagine this. Like on a, a busy street, they close the street off. The coaches are dancing from Pizza Chalet to a bar called Chirps. As the police officers have their sirens on playing the music for them, and the coaches are drinking, dancing down the street because they beat the boss's kids at the steel mill. It was that crazy. I mean, that's how big of an event it was. And I was in ninth grade when that happened, to watch that. So I was so jacked, and I was probably a better baseball player than I was a football player. But I was so jacked that I wanted to play football. I started lifting weights and running at night and running the stairs with Keith Truex and Jimmy Jones and Joe Smith. You know, we wanted to we wanted to be those guys, but we all weighed a buck nothing. But we were tough as shit, and everyone in Fontana was tough. So... Uh, that was kind of the backstory on that, and I wanted to see it to actually become a feature film. So I'm not going to sell out for fifty thousand or hundred thousand. I don't want it to be shelved on a shelf, and someone owns the rights to it, and the movie's never made. So my goal is now is to do the audiobook, uh, the the faux chronicles, and I'm going to try to send it to Dan Patrick and a, a guy named Mike Godfrey. You were too young to remember. Do you remember Mike Godfrey, the the magazine? No. Okay, well, before they started ESPN Magazine, I had uh, worked for Casey and uh, Mike Godfrey. It was called Mike Godfrey's Top Recruit Illustrated. And on the first cover is a quarterback 
who was a quarterback for the New York Giants, uh, Eli Manning. He was in Newman High School. And we had the first national high school and junior college football magazine. I was the sports announcer. You were probably real little back then. Mm -hmm. And I would talk on the radio. And then I would get to talk uh, at these different events, the Shiners Children Hospital. And I got to meet Mike Tariqo and all this. So anyway, am I talking too much? No. No, we're good? This we is good? what this podcast is for. All right, it's a pod. Okay, so I'm just giving you a little backstory on that. Uh, but the airplanes, like I said, that we went over, and I would get to... So anyway, we started a first... So Mike now is was an ESPN sports announcer. So they picked our, our brains, and they liked the magazine so much, the concept. We had guys with their shirts off and were real cocky. And I probably did one of the first high school... Combines with Reebok. Reebok came out, gave about a hundred pair of shoes away, and I did that. I want to say it was 1997. So the next year, ESPN Magazine flies Casey out to Boston, and I think John Vickers was his name. He was the vice president at the time. They want to look at what we're doing, and we thought they were going to purchase our magazine. But what they did is, I won't say they stole our concept, but they started ESPN Magazine six months later, wow. and they picked his brain. And that was 20 years ago, and True story, man. So uh, they they like the way that you see ESPN Magazine when you saw it. They would have guys with their shirt off, guys flexing, you know, cocky. Well, that's what we had with high school kids and college kids. We had guys standing on rocks, guys in cornfields, Brad. Guy in a cornfield, you know, a guy on a rock, big Samoan dude in the middle of the lake. Is this in the 80s as well? No, early 90s. In the early 90s? No, early 90s. Okay, buddy, we were a little cocky <laughs> back then. Okay, so, but we were cocky. So I went on to play junior college uh, at San Bernardino Valley College, and then I played football at University of Redlands before I blew my knee against San Francisco State. And then I got into coaching. Mm -hmm. And my high school coach gave me my first job, Dick Bruitt. And he's been a father figure to so many men and a mentor. And so they closed the mill in 1983. But when that Wide World of Sports and LA Times article came out, it catapulted us to national attention. They were thinking, these crazy son of a bitches in Fontana, they slap each other. So now we we would always have about 8,000 people going to the games. Now there was like 12,000 people. They had to get end zone seats. So everyone from 83 to, and they were closing the steel mill that year, to 87 were just coming to see us because they wanted to see the guys that would slap the guys. So they were hoping we'd get a penalty just so they could see someone else slap the shit out of them. <laughs> you know, so that's what went on with that. But this will be a great movie, and I know it's going to be a great movie. And I want to make sure that the right person gets it. So it has 26 football scenes, and I know they're going to condense it, but I want the color man and the sports announcer to be Dan Patrick. He's going to be my first guy. I'm going after Dan. I'm going after you, ESPN legend. And Mike Godfrey. I want those guys, and I used to work for Mike as a advertising uh, manager for his magazine. I want those two to actually be the announcers in the movie. Then it'll be authentic. Mm -hmm. And I even feel like I'll give up some of the rights. I don't care. So I that's say you go independent. Like, that'd be cool. It, it would be cool. But um, I wanted to... Uh, Maybe take it to Sundance or something. Uh, yeah, I want to do that as well. That would be nice. But I'm working also on a documentary, you know, but mm -hmm. we'll talk about that another time. My next one, we're going to talk about my documentary. Mm -hmm. That's called Chasing the Ring. And I'll tell you that story later. But we're going to talk about the foe still. So I've had a couple offers, Netflix too, and everything, and I've turned them all down. And I get about 10 to 15 requests every year I pitch it. I didn't go last year. And I you know, I want to make sure that the company has the finance. Because like I said, it takes five. They already think you're crazy. So it takes five to 30 million to make a sports movie. And you got to get the right people to sign on with you. You know, and I had the right people. Francis Ford Coppola's partner, Fred Roos, FR Productions, their lawyer, and uh, they had it. And I was I was kind of pumped. But, you know, it didn't work out. They passed on it because I pressured them because they were trying to make a documentary. So, can uh, are they going to be able to hear you here? Or echo? Yeah, I believe so. It looks like it's picking it up. I mean, uh, I could always um, turn up the volume. How do you know? See the waveform? How wave do you one? know? I have no Watch idea. Watch clap. See? All right. Some, all right. some uh, audio pleasure. Can we get some of your music? What can we get some of your uh, hip hop music in here? Why we getting any background? We can't due to uh, YouTube monetization. It will be copyright, and they'll they'll remove it. I do it all the time. Yeah. Facebook every time. I don't care. Well, well, speaking of music, don't didn't you write a song as well for this? Oh, I did. Why don't you just tell them the song? Oh hell yeah. 
Okay. Now, first of all, I can't sing. Okay, so let's get that shit straight right now. Okay. But about six years ago, when I would finish the script, I wanted uh, a song to be played at the end of the uh, of the movie. You know, and mm-hmm. and I was thinking Kid Rock kind of uh, Lincoln Park. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of mindset I had, right? And I wanted like a, a whisper with a scream. And I wanted, uh, and I, Lord knows I can't sing, okay, but I'm funny, so I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. But So uh, I wanted that kind of music. So you'd have to get the right person. I wanted some old, some new with some drums, and I wanted to kind of build up from a slow whisper into a scream, right? Mm-hmm. And I wanted to get something that everyone in the world would be, uh, you know, could relate to. So I, I did it Da Vinci, kind of 007 code, right? Mm-hmm. And so the Da Vinci part was, I'm talking about Fontana, California, but in the song, I also want everyone to know wherever the hell they're from, uh, it doesn't matter. So this, the name of the song was called That's My Town, right? So I had two versions of it the way I was going to do it. That's my town. All right, so I have a, it starts off, and I wanted to kind of start off with like a music box chime. I've asked Bradley like for several years to, mm-hmm. to, do the music for him. He's passed on it. You know, he's too cool. He's too hip hop. You know what I'm saying? But it's all right. It's I okay. just feel like you need real talent to do that song. You, you're talking about Kid Rock here. And, Link, and Lincoln Park. Yeah. Okay, they were pretty good. So. Well, and one of the singers from Lincoln Park is no longer with us, so that might not happen. So the uh, Blink Ready 2, I've been sent it to Sammy Hagar's family because they're Fontana guys, and I wanted to get Travis Barker from Blink you know, 182. But, you know, I really want just like a Kid Rock style. It could be like a country, it could be a funk, it could be. I don't know, but here's the, I'm going to give you the lyrics, okay? Because I haven't written the music, but I want the music. Although there is a band in Bakersfield, and they're a cover band mainly, but they're called Lipstick Revolver, and this girl, the lead singer, is off the chain. And if you get to hear it, they're going to make big things. She's about 30, but that band can play anything. They go hip-hop, country, rock. She's badass. Kind of a Pat Benatar vocalist. Mm-hmm. I saw that chick, and I said, this chick could do it. So you could either have one vocalist or do a duet. So I'm going to give it to you my version. Okay? That's my town. So here we go. Here's a story. I'm not down when the angels used to roll around in the still. When down under your feet and the women used to run the streets and the bars were back to the walls and the men had nothing but balls. We gave birth to a hospital. Doll every week we played football and our fans would kick your ass if you came talking trash that's my town so what do you say that's my town where I used to play that's my town still today that's my town in the USA that's my town <coughs> selling me flats that's my town where I lay <clears throat> you know it's true. That's my town. So fuck you. So that's the hook. That's the first verse. Let me get a drink before I get the second one in. Okay. So the second verse goes, Those days were always fast and the boys used to smoke the grass and the gals had the finest ass in our dates. One half a week, cause we potted in Lotto Creek in the summers. We used to bake at a spot called Lost Lake. That's my town. So what do you say? That's my town. Where I used to play. That's my town. Still today. That's my town. In the USA. That's my town. Felony Flats. That's my town. Where we lay the hat, that's my town. You know it's true, that's my town. So fuck you. So it goes back into that. You got the drum, little. I got a little hip hop with a little rock. So the last verse slows down a little bit. It goes, I've grown and I've moved away, but I still can't forget those days of the parties and all my lay. So this jam. Is a rocker spit and your jams don't mean shit. So here's my final toast to the place. I love the most, that's my town. 
So what do you say? That's my town. Where I used to play, that's my town. Still today, that's my town. In the USA, that's my town. Felony Flats, that's my town. Where we laid the hat, that's my town. You know it's true, so it slows down. That's my town, and everyone in the world at the concert lifts up their middle finger and says, so fuck you. So what it means is, it doesn't matter what the fuck, wherever I'm from, that's where I'm from, and that's my town. So everyone can relate to that. But the Da Vinci part is, I threw in some code words like, the steel melt under your feet, just talking about Kaiser Steel, and uh, we gave birth to a hospital Get it? We Kaiser Hospital was built in Fontana, California. So I reversed it. Instead of having birth in a hospital, we gave birth to the hospital. Little play on words like that. Mm -hmm. Solid hump. And the angels used to roll around. You see, that's Da Vinci. It was the Hell's Angels used to cruise the streets of Fontana in the day. See, I went Da Vinci on that one. You like that? That's good, huh? And so then, you know. Uh, Lost Lake was a place in Fontana that we, would, which now is a golf course that we would go and jump off of these cliffs and go into this Cory Lake. And Lado Creek is also up in North Fontana, and so creek that runs through the mountains and stuff like that. Well, you know, we worked up there, mm -hmm. me, you, and Matt, and uh, that cold ass and Jimmy. Gabe. Oh. No, Jimmy. me you and Jimmy. Remember, you oh, went yeah. through with the bears and shit yeah <laughs> i made these guys do some crazy that's shit crazy. And doing some crazy shit so anyway so that's my song that's my town thank you for making me sing that i was mm -hmm. really uh, really appreciative mm -hmm. i don't think it was that good but god bless you god bless you so it was good so the story uh my goal is to get it sold and i wanted to put it in the right hands you know my, my main thing is i want it to be made it's got a lot of great stories in it it's uh, a feel-good story but it's a sports story. It's from a worst to first. But it was, we might not have been the best football team ever, but we were hands down the toughest ever in the country. And just to imagine seeing your digital era, we actually played in a game. I was in college. And we went to a game against Vista in San Diego, Brad, mm. in 1987. And Fontana was number one in the state, and Vista was number four. And Fontana won 14 to 13. But before the game, the airplane that was digitized said beat the Panthers and it would fly over the game and had, you know, the, the wings would light up with, you know, writing on it, right? Well, they were by the San Diego Zoo and they had connections. You can never see this shit now. They had a Black Panther and they're walking the sidelines with a chain and it had a muzzle on it. And then they had it tied up. Uh, yeah, you'll never see that shit. That's crazy. That shit happened. Imagine that shit. You never see that shit ever again in a high school. Yeah, hell no. Black Panther. Uh, well, they had a chain on it. And they had people walking with it, but nevertheless, and they had a couple chains where they were walking it. But it was still walking down the sidelines, and they took it into. Come on, that's some crazy ass they shit. They went Wakanda on you, on you guys. I don't know what the hell they did, but Black Panther, Wakanda. I don't remember. Dude. You don't know comics. I do know. I know Black Panther. But that's Condonis. Yeah. So, what else? What else you want to know about the foe? I mean, if you don't want to give too much, we could stop there. I mean, you could tell them where it's at if you want. Yeah, it's on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. You get it for about $9 a pop. You look it up. Dennis Paulson, the foe. You can get the book. The foe Chronicles is coming out soon. I've got a five-minute version. Then I also have an hour version. I have over eight hours of tape of interviewing 20-plus people to tell the stories about the gambling I told you about, about the games, about the rivalries. And then I interviewed several people. I also have four hours of tape uh, that I have recorded uh, somewhere. And I also, you know, like I said, it took me eight years to write this. So this is a story of passion. It's been almost 20 years. I started it in 2000. It is 20 years. So it's been 20 years. I started writing this in 20 years ago. It's crazy. You were seven years old. And uh, it was published in 2009. And the script was written in 2012. So I hopefully I'm going to get it sold. And, you know, I remember when, reading stories and educating myself. When they did Rudy, it took seven years to make the movie Rudy. It's crazy. It took 15 years to do Friday Night Lights. So the first, this is about my sixth year I've been pitching it. So I'm right on track. <laughs> pitching the movie. So I want to thank you, Brody, for having me out here. And, uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, we are going to talk the next time I come out here I'll be prepared to look into the camera mm -hmm. and I'll know that um, we're going to do talk about uh, my documentary mm -hmm. and my documentary is uh, three weeks in October Chasing the Ring and I'll tell you about that later it's a baseball documentary I've been working on it five years we'll get into that so what else am I right now I'm an um, OSP telecom field engineer travel all over Braddy's in the game now, learning to be an engineer, right? Yeah. Inside, and uh, we work for some good companies, right? Mountaintop Communications, Ridgeline Communications, all ex-bosses of Verizon and GT back in the day, right? Yeah. Pretty cool the gig, so I'm always glad, but I, I'm glad that my son took the time to let me uh, talk and share my book with you, and I hope you liked our stories. And those are just some of the great stories, so get the book. Uh, read up more about it. I don't claim to be the greatest writer in the world, but I'm a hell of a storyteller, okay? And the audio book will be coming out before 2021, I promise. Okay, so thank you, and all right, brother. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Dad. I love you. I love you. All right, good stuff.